All right, so are we ready for this? Hey, I want to welcome all of our guests as well. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, I've already met some first-time guests who are with us, and you are not alone. We hope you've already felt loved in. Uh, we've got hundreds of people who are watching in the chapel and perhaps online and other places, and we just want to welcome everyone. So we live in the most sexually confusing and chaotic time in history. Now, that's a bold statement. But certainly in my lifetime, certainly in America, and I think it's in part because now we have such technology, um, medicine, and, and, and all the things that come into play with the topic that we're going to talk about. As we have uh, is, you know, r- rushed into this uh, series this, this summer and now into the fall as we're kicking off school, we have said that the foundational uh, truth that is um, the heart of everything we're talking about is Genesis 121. And it says this, so God created mankind in his own image. This is kind of a poetic um, way to talk about this, really the first poem in the Bible. You can see it here. The image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now this is such basic foundational truth and yet it's being challenged in our culture today like never before. We've been saying, last week we talked about how we are integrated, embodied, holistic people. That's who we are. Today we're gonna talk about the fact that we have been created as sexual beings. We are male or female. And what I wanna do is dive straight in. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 6. Okay, grab your Bible there, 1 Corinthians 6, and we're gonna go right at the topic as Paul does here. Um, now, this Wednesday night, uh, we'll talk more about this uh, as we close our service, but we're going to have uh, con- uh, continuing the conversation as we've had each week to dive deeper into this conversation. So you're not going to want to miss that. We've had incredible times uh, each Wednesday night uh, in the Great Hall, and you can join us this coming Wednesday night, 6 to 7. Don't miss it. We'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, this is Paul's letter, okay, always in context of what we're talking about here. Uh, This is his letter to the church in Corinth. Corinth was sin city, by the way. And you might know that to Corinthize, um, Corinthianize, I think is the word, is uh, is to be sexually promiscuous. I mean, it becomes a verb and it's because of what Paul is dealing with here. Now, it's important to note, this is another conversation altogether perhaps, he's addressing sin within the church. He is focusing on the church and saying, listen, the Christian vision of sexuality is radically different than the rest of the world. So he's watching Corinth and the people who live there, people who live in Dallas, right? North Dallas here in America in this time, the Christian vision of human sexuality, watch this, was and is a radical prophetic witness to a watching world. I mean, to live actually, how about this, to actually live out The sexual ethic that we see in scripture, that God created us male and female, that marriage is between a man and a woman, that sex is in the context of covenantal marriage alone between a man and a woman to actually live this out now has become a kind of a radical thing in our culture and I think a a great witness to the gospel and to the, the person of Jesus Christ. So all of this, God's plan for sexual purity is grounded, as we'll see here, in the life and love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so let's, let's dive in. We're going to see three things here. Take notes on sermons. Here it is. Uh, your identity is found in Christ. Paul lays all this out. Your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And your body, you have been created, designed to bring glory to God, all right? So here's, here's the first one. Your identity is found in Christ. There's a lot of talk about identity today. We're going to talk about that today. Verse 9, here it is, verse 9. He says this, or do you not know that wrongdoers will inherit the kingdom of God? Will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. This is such a great word for us. Okay, be aware, be alert, be wise, let's be smart, don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And listen to this, that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Okay, so having been created in the image of God, we are now in Christ, beloved children of God, a radical shift in our identity. He says, don't be deceived. Uh, We can say this today, right? This is so relevant. In our culture today, hey, uh, you do you, right? You you be you, you do you. Uh, Whatever you desire, you do it. That's what it was to Corinthianize. It is to, you could say, Americanize the gospel and the teachings of scripture in so many ways. Two things we see here. First, the reality of sin, okay? Now, this is um, in this list of things that he, of course, is sexual sin. It's not an exhaustive list. He could keep going on, right? But what is he getting at here? What he's saying is that sin, okay, separates us from God. And if you don't follow the word of God and the way of Jesus, you will not enter the kingdom of God, he says. And if he kept going on a list, well, we would all find ourselves in the list, okay, in some form. And then you look at Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, what Jesus says about uh, lust and adultery, all the things. Uh, we, we, We have no place to be prideful when we talk about this issue today. We, we're all sexual sinners because sexual purity is not as much a destination as it is a relationship with the pure one who has made us pure. And then we respond by giving our lives to him and being obedient. So first we see that sin separates, the reality of sin. Secondly, he's saying that there's this transforming power we have in Christ. Such were some of you, but not anymore. And all of this is past tense. You see this? You, you now are clean. You are sanctified. You have been already justified by Christ. So this is now who you are. Now live this out. Now we talk about this kind of thing all the time, but our whole devotion in life then is holiness, Right? I mean, sanctification, sanctus means holy, becoming holy. What does that look like? It looks like Jesus. Once we come to faith in Christ, our entire life, how about this? We have a very strict code of conduct as Christians to be just like Jesus. That's now our lives moving forward. So the way we talk about it here uh, at our church is we are radically devoted to holiness, I mean, we want to be just like him. We want to rid ourselves of sin. We want to be in constant uh, growth, a pattern of of constant relationship uh, with one another, growing in the Lord. It's why you're here today. I want to be more and more like Jesus. We're radically devoted to holiness, but we're also radically devoted to hospitality. I could say we, everyone is welcome, right? It's it's the late, great uh, Tim Keller's, you know, inclusive exclusivity of the gospel we talk about often everyone's included join us on this journey watch this to become holy to become like jesus you're invited in okay to come alongside all of us who are seeking to lay all of our preferences all of our desires as secondary to our desire to worship jesus as lord and become like him come and join us on this journey is what we're saying. And and this is what Paul is getting at here. So he then goes on to say, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 12. I have the right to do anything. Now he's offering a couple of slogans here from uh, culture. This is an interesting thing to note. Um, uh, Biblical writers were readers, okay? Biblical writers were cultural commentators. They knew what was up. He says, hey, you, you say I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Then he says, uh, you say this. Here's another cultural meme or slogan they had in their day. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy them both. Then he says, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us up too. Now, that last statement there seems like a kind of non sequitur, like, wait, you're talking about sex, what? Now you're talking about the resurrection. This is, he's saying there's great dignity in the body and the body will forever, we've talked a lot about this, will, will, will be transformed, will be given a resurrected body and, and will be in bodily form, okay, on the new earth 
in the resurrection, worshiping Jesus, the body matters for all eternity. So he's talking about freedom and responsibility here. And he he offers these two kind of cultural slogans. The the second one there, so, well, how about this first one? Did you catch this? I have the right. Starts there. He says, okay, no, 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 no. Because when we come to faith in Christ, Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, anyone who wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I have the right runs contrary to the life of a believer. You don't have any rights. You laid down your rights when you became a Christian. Jesus has all rights on my life. And any time and moment he doesn't, I am living the pseudo life that will lead ultimately to all kinds of trouble and destruction. The the next is this common trope of the day, food for the stomach, stomach for food. What he's saying is is this. Um, The idea was, hey, I I have hunger. I have natural desires, physical desires. I fulfill them. When uh, I have sexual desires, I fulfill them. That's what he, and he says, okay, not so fast. Not so fast because you now belong to the Lord. You have denied yourself and the dignity of the body matters so much. He's calling us to purity, holistic purity. And, and, And it means that we are to live just like Jesus again. Here's the question we're asking in these days. Are you a Christian? Watch this. It's possible to self-identify as a Christian in America today and not be a disciple of Jesus. Those are two radically different things. And that is the trouble in the American church. And, and so what is the end game here? He tells us your body is designed to bring glory to God. Look at verse 15. Do you not know? that your bodies are members of Christ himself. Now watch his logic. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said that two shall become one flesh. There's a mystery of this sexual union. And he says, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So as we live in union with Christ, what we see is how serious sexual sin is. Now, there are other sins that one commits outside the body. That's where he's heading here or or inside the body, you could say, whatever you ingest, whatever you put in your body. But he's noting the gravity of sexual sin and sexual morality impacts you in, in, in ways that other sins perhaps do not, right? Sex is between one man and one woman devoted for life. And we all uh, bring to this topic real, real tender moments in our hearts. And, and some of us have experienced abuse and others of us, so many um, issues around this, this topic. But what we're seeing today is... Uh, whether it be in the hookup culture or we see, we're going to talk about today in broader culture, there's this new Gnosticism that says, I can do whatever I want with my body, as one noted, right? I'm just a brain on a stick or this is just a meat suit. I can do whatever I want with my body because my body and my mind are two very different things. As if we have the soul or spirit we talked about last week and then the body can do what it wants. So what do we do? Look at what he says. He gets practical here or very much. What do we do? Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? And all who've been here love late, you go, no, we know this. We've heard this. Who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You see where he lands here? You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. He says, flee, run. And we can talk about, you know, practical ways that we need to guard our minds. Friends, this is a word for us today. Some of us as parents, young people, all of us, what are you putting in your mind? What are you looking at on your screens? Safeguards that you put around that accountability that you have around pornography or what you watch or what you read with open and honest relationships. We need to do this together, all rooted in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And look at this, his indwelling spirit to give us the power to overcome. Some of us who are trapped in sexual sin. He says this, he says, your body, here's here's the end game for Paul. Your body is to bring glory to God. That's it. Bring glory 
to God. And so wherever you are today, okay, and this is all of us, whether you're married, single, same-sex attracted, experiencing dysphoria or some incongruence uh, around your sexuality, um, the Lord is calling you. He's call- or how about this? You're, you're committed you're, to habitual sin in your life. He's calling you to repent today. He's calling you to give your life fully to him and he's calling you right now to do so. Your body belongs to God is what he says. It's for the Lord in verse 13. I mean, we can't get any clearer than this, right? So each week as we've had a different guest to come and share with us, an expert on the topic, um, months ago, I could not think of anyone that'd be better for today to come and join us, uh, Dr. Katie McCoy. Katie's been a member of our church for a few, uh, few years and has been serving as the director of women's ministry um, at Texas Baptist. She has a PhD in systematic theology. Um, and she talks about a lot, well, her whole doctoral work was on, on the intersection of, uh, of faith, theology, culture. Um, she has done a lot of work around Old Testament um, law and protection of women throughout and uh, just fascinating stuff. But she's written a book uh, entitled To Be a Woman. We've talked about this book. Everybody here, if you're interested in this topic, uh, should get this book. Every woman should get it. Every woman can share it with the girl they know. And all that's going on in our culture today, she takes it on with, with incredible research and with a, with a pastoral heart and love. But um, it is a wonderful book. You can get it on Amazon or anywhere else that's out there where books are sold. And I uh, would love for you to do that. So let's do this without uh, further ado. Let's welcome Dr. Katie McCoy. Come on up here. Katie. Yay. Hello, hello. We're so glad Thank you're here you today. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to Thank be here. Thank you. So I know this too. You are, um, that's sort of sad, but you're moving. You're moving to Atlanta to a new ministry that you're going to be involved in. Uh, we're going to miss you here. Thank You've been a lot you. to us here. But um, so in the midst of all of that craziness, thank you for, yeah, giving your time. You're literally like boxed up and all the stuff. So we're glad you're here today. Oh, it's so good to be thank here. You. Thank Tell you. us more about how did you get into this, this crazy topic and wow, that keeps on becoming a thing right at the center of culture. Mm-hmm. I kind of fell into it. So I was talking about this in sort of an academic perspective when it was just a few fringe stories, some things in the news that were just very unusual. And I was talking about them in relationship to uh, gender ideology, specifically feminist theory and how that's affected the way women understand themselves, their relationship to society and other people. And gradually, it just became more and more in the center of our cultural life. And all of a sudden, we had new terms that we were all adapting to and things that went from on the fringe to the center. And it seemed to happen overnight. Yeah. So that's what I'm curious about. In my lifetime, um, people my age or even, even younger, I remember, I remember transvestites, mm-hmm. you know. And you do a lot of work around transgender. So mm-hmm. we'll probably go there a lot, I suppose, here. But... Um, I remember that, like, well, the men dressing up like women, what's up with that? But now, now something has shifted, mm-hmm. unlike any time in my lifetime, and it's been relatively recent. How did we get to where we are? What is happening? Yeah, so I like to tell people, think about a big pot of soup, and into this pot of soup, you've thrown all kinds of ingredients. And these ingredients are things that tell us how we form our sense of self and significance, what it means to be human, how to have a happy and fulfilled life. And so now, um, especially post Sigmund Freud, now uh, it's no longer something that we do in terms of our sexual expression, but it's a it's some aspect of who we are, our identity. And so now, when you think about how there were transvestites that was for centuries, the case. In fact, this is something really not new in human history, certainly Western culture. But now it's taken on a different significance. Now it is uh, seen as who I am. And if you disagree with how I see myself, you are disagreeing with who I am and my identity. Mm -hmm. And now that becomes uh, an expression of something that is oppressive or um, hateful. Yeah, I think a lot of us, haven't we experienced that as Christians? Um, we're to live like Jesus, tr- full of truth and grace. Um, and now we live in a culture where if you speak the truth, na- you don't love me now, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. I thought you guys were all about love. 
Yes. Um, instead of the fact, well, no, I can disagree with, we all do this in relationships, all right? I can disagree with you, but I still love you. Yeah. And that's what's so challenging about this, uh, this cultural moment. It's true. Love is seen as just affirmation as opposed to loving someone enough to tell them what is good. And that presumes that there's a standard of good. And if it's become a core of my identity, now you're attacking me. Exactly. Um, how did we get there? I know you... You and I both have done a lot. You've done a lot more than me, but like Carl Truman wrote a book, What yes. is the Rise and Fall of... Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. That, and, then, and where yeah. he talks about um, emotivism yes. being the driver, mm-hmm. where it's my emotion or my desires. How about that? We often talk about um, my worth is not found in, in what I do. It's not found in the approval of others. It's mm-hmm. not found in what I have. But now there's this... It's found in my desires. What I feel. If I have certain feelings or desires, that's what defines me. Mm -hmm. Instead of some standard of truth, right? We put the truth of God on the shelf. Here we are. Right. right? Truth is now a subjective thing. It's something that you can discover within yourself. It's not something that is external to you. It's seen as something that only you can know. So you mentioned the you do you. Mm -hmm. You have the follow your heart, live your truth. It's this idea that your emotional or psychological self is your truest self. And anybody that would disagree with that is trying to squeeze you into this very hypocritical way of living. Mm -hmm. And that's just not worth living at all. And so it's now something that we valorize and hold up as as, uh, courageous the person that goes against those cultural norms and against those expectations. And we especially see that in the area of sexuality and gender today. Wow, so, um, and how relevant is the word of God, right? I mean, Paul's words, he's talking about freedom and and responsibility. That's Mm -hmm. really what we're Mm -hmm. talking about is there there are really two aspects or two ways to define freedom. Both become what Jonathan Haidt calls a moral vision. Mm. One is um, freedom means I can do whatever I want to do. Come against that because it's subjective and there's no their core reality there or, or God in the mix. The other is no, no, no. Freedom is doing what I ought to do, which is determined by God. If I can't do what I ought to do, that's not freedom. That's bondage. Exactly, exactly. And so... Two very different ideologies, if you will, going on yeah. in our world. Um, parse that out a little more. How do you see this in, in culture? How we got there? What, what, what is happening? Yeah. When, when you were speaking and talking, walking us through 1 Corinthians 6, something that stood out to me is how science and neurology is catching up with the wisdom of Scripture. And um, when you, that, that phrase that every other sin we commit outside ourselves, but sexual sin we commit against ourselves. Mm. And scientific inquiry is, is just now finding that everything that we do sexual, sexually is formative. It is changing us. It changes our neurological structure. It changes literally how our brain functions. And just the, the whole person integration that God created sexuality to be, we, we are sitting again the design that God created us to have Uh. and to live with that freedom. And everything that we see in scripture points us to a holistic, whole person vision of humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have that all the way back in Genesis 1. So in Genesis 1, we have male and female. Genesis 2, we have man and woman. That's totally intentional. Those aren't just arbitrary words. Um, Scripture is telling us, the Holy Spirit is telling us that to be male is to be man, to be female is to be woman. In other words, our biology and then our relationships, how we relate to ourselves and others, were always intended to be an integrated whole. And culture today tells us you find freedom by dissecting yourself, by separating yourself from yourself. Mm Um, as opposed to the Christian vision for humanity, which is a whole person. Uh, you gave me some insight there on then what Paul means when you sin against your body. You know, you go, yeah. well, others, like I said, other sins are against my own body. But you're saying, no, you're going contrary to the very body, male or female, that you've been given by giving it over to other things apart from the will of God. So the big challenge today then, um, we're seeing... Um, We're seeing kids uh, transitioning uh, more than ever before. We're seeing uh, in the teenage years and such. Um, Why are we seeing more of that in our day today? Yeah, so that goes back to that big pot of soup that a lot of ingredients have been thrown into it over the course of decades. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a, a lot of research about this, but there's three 
elements. One is um, peer contagion or the influence of friends. So especially among teenage girls, if their friend is trans or non-binary, it's usually a matter of time before they adopt that as well. And the reason it's affecting girls so much more than it is affecting boys is I think it's kind of the exploitation of how God made girls. Girls uh, naturally um, co-ruminate and uh, take on the problems of their friends and um, they internalize mm-hmm negative emotions in ways that boys don't. That's part of why we're seeing this data totally flip uh, in the last 15 to 20 years. The second is a lot of children, so teens and um, adolescents and younger, they have something else going on. And that expression of gender dysphoria, more often than not, is a symptom it's a symptom of something else. And it could be that there's already a diagnosis of anxiety or depression or something like that. But a lot of times it could be that this is sort of a problem coming out sideways, whether it is Mm. some type of trauma or some type of uh, problem at school or with relationships or they moved to a new place or their parents got divorced. And it doesn't mean that these kids are acting, it's that they're redirecting and they're finding this is a way that I can get positive attention and the help that I need because there's something else going on. Mm. To their child's mind, they're not putting that together, but that's where they need the wisdom of adults who are looking out for them and do have the prefrontal cortex of their brain fully developed after 25 to make Mm. sure that they're not making life-altering decisions based on a phase. And then the final is social media. Social media has just... um, proliferated these ideas. Don't most find that, like, while I'm wrestling, I'm struggling, yes. um, and then they find somebody on YouTube or whatever. Like, Precisely. Ah, there we go. Reddit, now have found my TikTok. people or yep. something. Yep, they find acceptance. They find someone to say, you know, I felt like this too, and then I transitioned, I got on testosterone shots, and I loved myself. Mm-hmm. And so, really, when you look at what people are looking for, they're looking for that sense of whole person integration, meaning, significance, and ultimately peace. So you talk about trauma. I, for a lot of us, um, we could a lot of us could say, "Man, just going through middle school was traumatic." Oh right? yeah. Um, I mean, we're all Somewhere Riley just... on Inside Out too. We're all you know just trying to figure out who we are, and that's traumatic enough. Um, J.K. Rowling, who you know Harry Potter fame, she has come out um, very clearly uh, in regard to her position on transgenderism and such, and she's getting canceled and slammed and all the things. But she is one who said. The cure, it's how she said it, the cure to uh, sexual dysphoria is to allow kids to go through puberty. Um, What do you say to that? What are you seeing in research and all that you've done? Yeah, so this is one of the ways that uh, this issue has become so politicized. It it used to be uh, that a child with gender dysphoria, so the feeling that your body is out of alignment with who you perceive yourself to be, that that child would grow out of it at puberty. Puberty is remarkably clarifying as to whether you are a boy or a girl. And so children would grow out of this at somewhere between 80 and 90% that they would come back into alignment of their self-perception harmonizing with their physical bodies. Well, it just so happens that the one thing that the medical community has been pathologizing and medicating away is puberty, Mm. putting children on puberty blockers at younger and younger ages. And by the way, these puberty blockers, um, like so many things in our fallen world, it is something that was begun as a, 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 a mark of human ingenuity and creativity. So these drugs were created to help people with hormonal cancers mm. to give them a fighting chance. Mm. It would arrest the production of hormones so that the patient could have a chance for the chemo or the radiation to work. And like so many other things in our fallen world, it's distorted and perverted and used for something that is destructive. Yeah. So... Uh, Tell us, what are some patterns um, that we can watch for? I'm thinking of parents. Um, What are some things we can look for? Common denominators among kids who struggle. Um, Yeah, how could you, how how do you guide parents? You talk about this all over the nation. How do you talk to parents? How can we, what can we learn? In a few minutes, right? But right, go ahead. exactly. So, what, what, would your, what would be your word for parents? I, 
I like to tell, preface it with this, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a parent, so there's a limit in how much I can serve you, but I can give you the data dump and uh, for you to know, the biggest thing is social media. So um, the algorithms really are out to get your children mm. and uh, that's not an exaggeration to say. It's not a conspiracy theory. There are really forces at work ideologically and spiritually that are trying to reach children with messages about who they are. So um, you can have a child who grew up in all of the right um, church curricula and learning all the right things and left to themselves with their smartphone, they can be introduced to all mm. kinds of ideas that, that manipulate um, their own insecurity as a 12, 14, and 16-year-old. So there's that. There's also some things that parents are just now becoming aware of educationally and in children's entertainment. So children's entertainment, younger and younger ages, Preschool-aged um, uh, shows are introducing kids to mm -hmm. ideas like um, double mastectomies, trans identity, um, and these are things for like four-year-old programming. My my favorite example was a children's book called Bunny Bear, where this bear uh, feels like a bunny, wants to be a bunny, ah. but um, he's a bear, and uh, he decides to go move into the bunny's home, but these horrible judgmental bunnies, they kick him out. And don't these bunnies realize that just because he looks like a bear, he's actually a bunny? Well, that's essentially social indoctrination to all of the debates we see about mm -hmm. males and women's social spaces. Um, and then education as well. Uh, parents have to get very pointed and very inquisitive about not only the formal curricula that's taught related to sex and gender, but the informal conversations of what uh, is being introduced to children at younger and younger ages. Sounds like, so there's so much more to say there. Um, we can dive deeper on Wednesday night, but uh, it sounds like we just need to love our kids well and have real relationship with them, be fully present, um, ask all the good questions, and, and I mean, that's what the Christian home is all about, right? Yeah, I mean, you can't, it's impossible to fully shield a child from these things. You know, if you just go to the grocery store, I was in Central Market months ago and I saw a bearded man in a dress. And it was like, if you, if you had, let's say, a five-year-old with you, mm -hmm. that's very confusing. And you have to suddenly introduce this child to this concept. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what parents can do is, in age-appropriate ways, teach the, uh, the real, the, the true design, so that their children can recognize counterfeits. Yeah, right. and I always like to think about how, um, if you worked at a bank and they wanted to teach you what uh, a counterfeit dollar bill was, they don't right. introduce you to all the different counterfeits. There's always gonna be another one. They introduce you to the, the real, real thing, thing. Yeah. so that you study that so much and so well that you can identify the counterfeits. So yeah. telling children things like, God made your body and your body is good. Mm. God made you a boy or a girl. You can have all the different interests that you want to. If you're a girl, you can play in the mud. If you're a boy, you can like reading and cooking and all those things. But God gave you your identity as a boy or a girl, and that makes him happy. Yeah, so live that out, right? Yes. Okay, so we need, to, we need to wrap this up. But one of the things I've thought about too, in such a sexualized culture, a lot of people think as we wrestle with our identity and who we are, um, it's possible to be a middle school teenage, even a young adult, and think, gosh, what I need is I need, I need a boyfriend, you know, or I need a girlfriend. I need to get married. Then I would be holistic and, and happy and all the things. When actually, um, no, you need friends is what you need. You know, I think, I think we've lost the power and the beauty of Christian friendship. It's a great point. And how important it is. And so we, again, we sexualize our, our longings or our challenges, thinking that's the direction I need to go, when in reality, no, no, no. You need really healthy, godly friends that can help guide you through all that you're going through, yeah, right? Yeah, real relationships. Yeah. And then even expand that to we talk about the Christian vision of humanity, not only in relationship, but where we find significance and meaning. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this um, a few days ago, that when you hear a transgender person talk about their identity, you hear some common denominators, and it's usually things like, there's something wrong with me, I was born this way, mm -hmm. and I need to be a new person even to the point of taking on a new name. And what an amazing tee-up we have right. for the gospel. Yes. Like, yes, there is something wrong with you, and you, you were born like this. You do need to be like a this. new person. Yes, right? you do yeah. need to be made a new person. 
uh, and you need a new name. Isn't it amazing how everything that uh, the Holy Spirit really has given us everything for life yeah. and godliness, that yeah. we have the opportunity to speak into this cultural moment and say, here's everything that you're looking for, so and good. you're trying to find it in a shot or a surgery or a pill, mm. and you need new birth from the Spirit out Praise the Lord. We really do. He really is the answer. Yes. Isn't he? Y'all, let's thank uh, Katie for being with us today. We're so grateful for you. Wow. So I know we're all thinking, um, gosh, let's go another hour, you know. We're going to come back Wednesday night. Uh, We'll talk more about that as we close our services. But I'm going to close um, this portion of of our message by saying this. Um, It is true. Again, wherever we are, and just, you know, the sexual piece is one that we can all wrestle with and see in culture in so many ways, but the Lord has given us everything that we need, and he is the one, as we said at the start of of Paul's word to us, and we say it every week, he's the one who defines us. What we need is a new life. We need a new heart. Um, We need a new uh, redemption that comes to us in Christ. So if you don't know the Lord, if you've not received him, He says today, you come to me. He's died on the cross for you. So that all of your shame, your past sin, future sin is taken away on him so that you could be totally forgiven and completely loved by him. That's your your identity and to be invited into his family. So if you have not received Christ, I want to just pray over you right now. And then I want to challenge you to join our church today. Come talk to us and also seek help. You're not alone. We have the center here for counseling. We can have uh, others of us that can help you today even. Ministers, we can point you to resources. There are um, parental support groups that are helpful. There are groups out there that are, are, are people who have wrestled with same-sex attraction or dysphoria, all the things, and are yet are committed to a biblical, historical, orthodox uh, vision of, of human sexuality. And they're saying, let's do this together. Let's obey the Lord and show the world what it is to follow him and find our desires in him. So let's pray together as we uh, close this portion of our service. Lord, thank you so much for this time we've had. Thank you for Katie. We praise you for her life. And we pray blessings over her. And I ask, Lord, that even now, as we've heard from you, all of us have a lot of questions and some of us need to respond, all of us in varying degrees. So, Lord, we give our lives anew to you. You are our Savior. You are our only Redeemer. And we give our lives to you fully today as we seek to live holy lives before you and to bring our bodies before you to give glory to you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.